This this is your dad, Gordon. And uh, oh, I just got to tell you about our Christmas and what's gone on here in the past couple of weeks. Uh, your mother gave me a nice coat for Christmas. Uh, I think it cost something like thirty-two dollars. And uh, incidentally, the plant gave your mother and I uh, a gift certificate from Ropers uh, for thirty-four dollars. It so happens that uh, at Ropers is where she bought this present of mine, this coat, and so. She charged it, and of course we'll pay our bill with that gift uh, certificate. <laughs> Does that sound like your mother's figure? Uh, did you ever hear how your mother pays her tithing? I, I just found that out this week. I never did. I never, <laughs> never did know it. She figures out her tithing, how much she owes. You know, she makes. I think it's fifty dollars a week, something like that, and and she figures out how much she owes the the Lord for tithing, and then she goes down to the plant and writes a company check for it. <laughs> She's got a little to tell you about her Christmas present. I bought her, and I've got a whole lot the same way of paying for that that she figures out on mine. We're getting along well. We're sure glad that the Ronnie and Ray and the kids are here. That little Tommy's a scream. He'll come to you and he'll get you by the finger and say, Peas, and Peas. He wants to go somewhere and he'll say, Peas. And if you don't come right away, well, about the third time, he'll read it, Peas. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that means please, you know supposed to go. Well, we'll pass this on to one of the other people. Sharon just goofed this. She turned the machine on the wrong direction, so it's kind of a little fouled up here at the last end where the kids were talking. I, your dad was so smart about my Christmas present to him. I'll have to tell you about his birthday present to me. He brought this Mercury home and said, well, now this is your birthday present. This is Mother's birthday present. Well, two months later, on our wedding anniversary, after 34 years, I go up to the bank and I find out he's mortgaged it to cover all his overdrafts. So he isn't so smart after all. Sherry and Sharon and Gary are home this weekend. We sure have enjoyed having them here, and they're just now getting packed, ready to go back to Ogden. We've had more snow again, and the weather's been terrible here this winter, so you aren't the only one that's had bad weather. I'll turn it over and let Sharon and Gary say a few words to you. Marion and I have spent this afternoon putting these songs together at the request of both Sharon and Nola Jean so that the grandkids will have a little better understanding of what their grandpa was like. Uh, Marion suggests that I do something to help fill up the balance of the tape here other than singing. And so as I reminisce back, I remember the first Christmas that I believe that I ever had. I was about six years old at that time. We were in Raymond, Alberta, Canada, out there on a ranch across Creek. And they were having a Christmas party, and my mother was preparing me for that party. I was on the program. And my sisters had taught me a recitation. And they also taught me how to say the ABCs both forward and backwards. So, uh, as I went to that party, I gave this recitation. I've got a tiny little brother all tucked down in the crib by mother. He looks as if he's run a race because he has the reddest face. Mine gets red too when I am tan from laying in the seaside sand. But mother rubs a cold cream white on my skin every night. And so, I gently tiptoed in and rubbed cold cream on baby's skin. He squirmed and didn't like the game. And then he yelled and nursey came. I'm doing penance now for fair. I'm tied down in the rocking chair. At that time, about in that time, the school was having a party. And our class uh, was being called upon to say the ABCs, and they were having an awful time. The kids would get up to say the ABCs, they couldn't hardly say them. My sisters had taught me these ABCs, and when it come my turn to get up, well, I got right up, and without saying anything to anyone, I said those ABCs backwards. 
Z Y X W V U T S R Q P O N M L K J I H G F E D C B A. Of course, that received a big applause from the whole congregation. You see, in those days, the uh, the classes weren't divided up in different rooms. It was only a small community, and all of the classes, from even the primer grade right on up to the ninth grade, all met in the one room with just one teacher. And there was a quite applause over this particular thing. <clears throat> there was another recitation that I remember from back in. Oh, I wasn't six years old when I learned this one. I was more like 12 or 14. And it's the cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun with the men who moil for gold. The Arctic Trail has its secret tale that'd make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge where I cremated Sam McGee. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee where the cotton blooms and blows, and why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole, I wouldn't know. He was always cold, but that land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell. He'd often say in that homely way, I'd rather live in hell. One Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold through the Parker's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If your eyes were closed, then the lashes froze, till sometimes you couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, the dogs were fed and the stars overhead were dancing heel and toe. He turned to me, cap, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. And he said with a kind of a moan, it's the cursed cold that's got right hold and chilled me clear through to the bone. But it's not being dead that's my awful dread. It's the icy grave that pains. I'm asking you that foul or fair you'll cremate my last remains. Well, a friend's last need is a thing to heed. I swore it wouldn't fail. We started on at the streak of dawn. Gee, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched in the sleigh and he raved all day about his home in Tennessee. And ere nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death. And I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was strapped to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, you can tax your brawn and brain, but you promised true, and now it's up to you to cremate these last remains. Well, the promise made is a debt unpaid. The trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart how I loathed that load. And by the long, long nights, by the lone firelights, while the huskies round and ring howled out their woes to the homely snows, Gee, how I curse that thing. And every day that quiet clay seemed a heavier, heavier grow. Though on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad, and I felt half mad, but I swore I wouldn't give in. I'd often sing to the hateful thing, but he would hearken with a sort of a grin. Until I came to the marge of Lake LaBarge, and an old derelict there lay. It was jammed in the eyes, and I saw in a thrice it was called the Alice May. I looked at it, and I thought a bit. Then I looked at my frozen chum. And here, says I, with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some plank I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was laying around. I piled on higher and higher. The flames just soared, and the furnace roared. Such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in that glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, because I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. The heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my face, and I don't know why. The greasy smoke in an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in that snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out and danced about before again I ventured near. 
I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peek inside. I think he's cooked, and this time I've looked, so the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heart of that furnace roar. He wore a smile you could see for a mile, and he said, Please close that door, it's warm in here, but I greatly fear you let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree in Tennessee, this is the first time I've been warm.